1985, one company decided to profit off of the environmental fervor that had pervaded the 70s. They ran a series of ads like this one. Do people really do these things just to help an endangered species make it through the night? People do. The ads were part of the People Do campaign which highlighted how workers were changing landscapes to aid local wildlife. The campaign was such a success that it ran well into the 1990s, and the ads even won an Effie Advertising Award for Green Eco Marketing in 1991. But these commercials had a sinister purpose, one that masked the environmental pollution and destruction of the company that made them. Today, we're going to unpack so-called corporate responsibility and greenwashing what it means, how commercials and tactics like the People Do campaign work, and why corporations like the one that made those commercials don't care about us or the planet. This video is sponsored by CuriosityStream, which now comes with Nebula for free when you sign up using the link in the description. The late 1980s weren't a good time for Chevron's environmental track record. In 1985, one of the company's refineries had just been exposed for contaminating the local groundwater by leaking millions of barrels of oil into the ground. Then three years later, the company paid $550,000 to settle a lawsuit brought in connection with toxic emissions at its plant in Richmond, California. Then again in 1991, it pleaded guilty to violating both the clean water and clean clean air acts, paying millions of dollars in damages. So the fossil fuel giant decided to do something about their tattered public image. Starting in 1985, Chevron shelled out somewhere between five to $10 million a year to create the People Do campaign. That's right, the company behind those nature-filled commercials was the oil corporation Chevron. Throughout the campaign, Chevron paid an estimated $200,000 to make each 30-second ad that marketed initiatives like their butterfly preserve. The El Segundo Blue lives on wild buckwheat, on land that's part of an oil refinery. A preserve that cost just $5,000 a year to maintain. A mere glance at the price tag reveals where the oil corporation's motives lie. But this type of ad campaign is common for corporations, especially large multinationals. Fast forward to today and greenwashing or using environmental rhetoric to boost sales or brand image while simultaneously polluting or destroying the environment pervades marketing campaigns. From oil giants like Exxon, Carbon capture is important technology to Nestle, at Nestle, we steward water resources, right down to Instagram ads on your feed. Each of these companies have a vested stake in misleading you into believing that the product they're selling, and ultimately their company, is aiding in social and environmental change. But when it comes to greenwashing, there is a lot more at stake than getting misled. From behind his desk in the economics department of the University of Chicago, Milton Friedman, the father of neoliberal economics, penned an op-ed for the New York Times. The year was 1970, and government regulation was trendy in the halls of Congress, passing numerous laws seeking to protect environmental and human well-being. But Friedman saw it differently. In his view, these regulations were not only bogging down corporations, but they were also forcing businesses to do something that they were not meant to do. In his view, the only social responsibility of corporations is to turn a profit for their shareholders. Regulations, according to Friedman, just slowed down the machine of progress. This is the core of neoliberalism a theory of deregulation and free market business that is foundational to American and global enterprise today. Profit above all else. Which is why greenwashing and claims of corporate responsibility must be seen less as harmless misdirection and more as tools essential to the capitalist quest of expanding corporate profits. Under capitalism, a corporation's primary goal is to generate profit for shareholders and the capitalist class. To do otherwise, to carve out space for the environment or, God forbid, the working class, would mean fewer investors, less profit, and ultimately, bankruptcy. If, however, a company like Nestle, H&M, or Chevron can be seen as working towards the common good through PR campaigns and savvy marketing without having to fundamentally change their business operations, then they've just protected or even expanded their profits. 
But there are also a couple of other reasons why so-called corporate social responsibility and its offshoot greenwashing are so insidious. For one, it rewrites the narrative of what change and climate action means. BP's carbon footprint campaign is a perfect example of this. By redirecting public attention from their oil spills and emissions back towards our own personal carbon footprint, the oil giant made climate action much more about individual endeavors than corporate malfeasance. We see this again and again, such as with H&M's campaigns that co-op phrases like eco-warrior and climate crusader to get you to buy more clothes. Essentially, these marketing schemes make us think that we can buy our way out of social problems, when in reality, the very companies we are buying from are causing those social problems. The second way greenwashing is so threatening is that it lulls us into a false sense of security. If we believe that corporations are changing for the good, then we can sit back and let them do their work. This is exactly what Chevron's People Do campaign was all about. Indeed, Chow Gunter, director of the Public Media Center in San Francisco, notes that through their misleading ads, Chevron implies that maybe we don't need a regulatory framework because oil companies are taking care of it. In short, if corporations can trick us into trusting them to do good, then they can do whatever they want. Greenwashing allows for businesses to continue their destructive practices by tossing scraps to us and claiming that they're giving us a whole meal. Because any real change, any effective climate action, means changing the paradigm. Real solutions to the climate crisis, like degrowth, building with local materials, agroecological farming, and eco-socialism, all spell disaster for corporations, because it means shifting priorities away from profits and towards people and planet. Regardless of what these companies say, their actions speak louder than their words. In 1988, while their ads were blanketing TVs and magazines, Chevron's El Segundo refinery leaked an estimated 252 million gallons of oil into the surrounding groundwater. And to this day, Chevron refuses to clean up an oil spill so egregious that it came to be known as the Amazon Chernobyl. From 1964 to 1992, Texaco, which is now owned by Chevron, dumped 72 billion liters of toxic water, polluting a 1,700-mile area in the Ecuadorian rainforest and tainting the water supply for indigenous communities living near the oil wells. But Chevron isn't the only corporation claiming they're doing good while they quietly destroy our surroundings. Home Depot, for example, recently had to pay a $28 million settlement because it illegally dumped toxic waste in California despite running marketing campaigns aimed at consumers to recycle their homemaking materials. And Nestle, with its claims of sustainable water and packaging, is anything but sustainable. First of all, wrapping water in plastic is causing a single-use plastic waste crisis. But to add insult to injury, Nestle's subsidiaries like Arrowhead Water, which sources its water partly from California Springs, an area notoriously racked by a mega drought, have been repeatedly accused of sucking aquifers dry wherever they operate. These exploitative corporate practices reveal that to make the most profit they can, corporations try to externalize as many costs as they can. And if they can say they aren't externalizing those costs while they actually are, then they've won. But at the price of the planet and the people slaving away under brutal conditions. Greenwashing and corporate social responsibility are tactics plain and simple. They're used as ways to distract from the metaphorical boot on our throats and on the throat of our planet. These misleading marketing campaigns are just another example of the resilience of capitalism. For as long as capitalism continues to reign, so too will the laborious task of deciphering misleading messaging. Capitalism is the problem. Think about how hard it is to find quote-unquote sustainable goods. And even after all that hard work, it's still difficult to figure out whether the company is telling the truth. 
Because here's the thing, there's no ethical consumption under capitalism. But the reason why there is no ethical consumption under capitalism is because there are no ethical corporations under capitalism. Even B corporations like Patagonia are still driven by the profit motive and the bottom line. All this means that to end greenwashing, to create economies where materials and goods are crafted to fulfill uses rather than to fill wallets and make profits, we must end capitalism. But building the power to do so, especially in imperial core countries like the United States, is a multi-decade process. And the climate crisis demands action now. Which is why we need to start implementing harm reduction strategies that use available tools today. These look like forcing corporate transparency through lawsuits, third-party auditing, and using regulating bodies to actually enforce regulations as a way to make corporations live up to their promises. But importantly, these harm reduction strategies must mesh with the longer-term work of building a post-capitalist world. One that envisions an economy built on truths, on real environmental stewardship, and on human and community well-being. Of all the big multinationals professing to be climate saviors, Nestle is certainly one of the worst. Unfortunately, I didn't have the time to fully dive into Nestle's greenwashing campaigns in this video, so instead I made a little bonus part about Nestle's environmental practices, and I've uploaded that section as an extended edition of this video on the streaming platform my creator friends and I built called Nebula. The bonus content replaces this ad because there aren't any ads on Nebula. And you'll not only see a lot of extended editions, exclusive content, and ad-free videos over on Nebula from me, but also from channels like Second Thought, who just released the first episode of his Nebula original series exploring the history, ideology, and contemporary resurgence of fascism. It's amazing and I highly recommend watching it. But at its core, Nebula allows viewers to support creators directly so they don't have to worry about the pesky YouTube algorithm. Nebula is awesome, but it's now made even better with our partnership with CuriosityStream. Curiosity Stream is the go-to streaming platform for thousands of top-tier documentaries, like the amazing new documentary series Evolve, which follows biologist Patrick Ayi in his quest to discover animals inspiring biomimicry solutions across the world. And because CuriosityStream loves supporting educational creators, we worked out a deal where if you sign up with the link below, not only do you get access to CuriosityStream, but you'll also get Nebula, for free. And this isn't a trial. You'll have Nebula as long as you're a CuriosityStream member. What's even better is that CuriosityStream has a special deal for my viewers. 26% off their annual plan. That's a little over a dollar a month for both CuriosityStream and Nebula. By signing up, you not only directly support our changing climate, but you gain access to thousands of documentaries and exclusive videos from your favorite creators. So if you want to support both Our Changing Climate and hundreds of other educational content creators, go to curiositystream.com OCC or click the link in the description and sign up for CuriosityStream and Nebula for just $14.79 per year. That's 26% off. Thanks so much for watching all the way to the end. If you've already signed up for Curiosity Stream, you can also support me by becoming an Our Changing Climate patron on Patreon. Just pledging $1 a month allows me the flexibility to keep making more videos like this. So thanks again for watching, and I'll see you in two weeks.